Well, thank you very much, uh, Husheng, and thank you for the, the invitation. It's my first time at Sen Island, which is a, it's a tragedy in itself. I hope it's not my last. And uh, um, fascinating uh, set of papers. And I'm just going to basically throw out a few comments and questions and maybe some of my own thoughts on them and, and uh, some of the matters raised. So, uh, starting with Moya and, and the acquisitions, um, acquisitions policy. Uh, of uh, the BNA and its associated, uh, obviously, institutes. I was, I thought, very struck, and I thought it was very uh, good of you to bring out this notion that this wasn't obviously simply a question of plundering the East uh, for various artifacts, and that actually, uh, although I was, I was quite surprised to see, see how, how, at the forefront of this policy of acquisition, was an idea of, uh, of learning from the East, in actual fact, that one wanted to go out there to find uh, ways of. Uh, of acquiring better, better design. One thinks of Steve Jobs actually in, this, in the, the late, the late Steve Jobs and his, his design to get east to find ways of designing things better in the West. I thought perhaps the one thing I had a little question mark on so is I thought perhaps you were a little bit too generous to Master Dean Sharp because I, I, mm. I thought this attitude of him sort of wanting to help us learn about uh, uh, aspects of the Eastern Persian culture. My uh, reading of Master Dean Sharp is I, I often wonder whether he knew what he was doing. Yeah. Um, I, I, I sort of get the impression that he liked sending little bits and pieces abroad, and he liked travelling abroad, but probably didn't really fully understand what the civilising um, aspects of, 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 you know, the cultural exchange was all about. I mean, if you look at some of the aspects of uh, even the archaeology that was taking place in Lake uh, Arjo Iran, he seems to have a very, very sort of, I wouldn't say dismissive, but rather sort of, um, uh, uh, I, I, what would the right word be, but... Uh, um, not a very, not very deep understanding really of what it was all about. So that was the, the, the only thing. And of course, I think you quite rightly brought out these, these ideas that in amongst this sort of process, this civilizing process, or this idea of improving um, attitudes in the West, of course, um, a lot of dealers uh, probably did a lot of rather uh, unfortunate things, I think in particular the Horton Shah, what happened to that. Oh, yeah. um, but as you say, I think the Harjels and certain sort of families in Iran were fully complicit in some of this sort of basically black market dealing, as far as we could see, of, of, of sending artifacts uh, westward. But certainly the idea of it as being something where you wanted to educate the public fits in very well, I think, with the notion of the enlightenment narrative that you get in the Whig tradition and you get in, in, in the West in this period. Ah, uh, now back to Lady Shield, that uh, interesting Lady Shield, which I'm pleased to say I actually teach Lady Shield a little bit in, in my class on Britain and Iran, actually. I might have to change things a little, only a bit, because as you quite rightly say, uh, Brendan, uh, it's glimpses, isn't it? It is glimpses. Um, uh, and I was interested, actually, in the way, you know, what, what she was projecting and how, in part, as you said, she projected her own anxieties, I suppose, partly onto onto her Persians, as she found. I thought we were quite right to stick with the term Persian because it's very much part of her sort of conception of what the Iranians are about. Um, however ignorant in some ways she may have been about the whole um, uh, project. Um, of course, this sort of notion, this racial stereotyping, uh, in some ways, I mean, there's, uh, there's a couple of things that are quite striking about it. One is that I suppose she's on the cusp of this movement, that this whole racial discourse really comes into Europe forcefully in the post-1850 period. So she is, um, uh, she is very much on the cusp of this. And I was, I'm, I'm struck by a lot of these attitudes that she sort of expresses would not have been actually adopted by many of the British Orientalists or others prior to that period. They had a much more open sort of attitude to what the problems were uh, in Iran. And it wasn't characterized as sort of a racial thing, but more as an aspect of bad government and what despotism meant for the way in which society worked. And I think in particular, people like Malcolm or Harford Jones or others, who were extremely critical of Moria, actually, in his view. I mean, they were horrified that James Moria's Haji Baba Esfahan, a satire, but it's a very funny novel, they sort of said, but for goodness sake, don't take it seriously. And a lot of them, in fact, uh, Harford Jones has a preamble, I think, to his own memoirs of Iran, where he says, please don't take, you know, uh, James Moria's characterization of the Iranians or the Persians, you know, it is a satire. It's not meant to be taken seriously. And I think that the sad fact is that in the post-1850 period, you certainly get a number of, particularly people working in the, uh, in the European Telegraph, in the, um, the Telegraph Company, saying that all I need, I'm off to Iran for five years, all I need to read is Haji Baba Isfahan, and that'll sort me out. And that's basically the sort of stereotyping that takes place. But it's very much challenged um, earlier on by uh, Orientalists prior to that. But sadly, it's sort of reinforced the sort of racial stereotyping, and this is something that 
uh, I found quite uh, quite shocking, really, actually, that a lot of the racial stereotyping that takes place is actually a liberal project in the post 1850s. Um, one of the striking writers on Iran, obviously, that we are mostly familiar with is Brown. And if you read Brown's descriptions of Turks, it's very racial. I mean, it's very racial. He almost says it, but it's part of the discourse of the post-1850 Europe. I mean, obviously, it occurs in different places in different parts of Europe. But certainly in, in, in London society, if I can put it that way, or in the English society, it's, it's a liberal tradition that actually brings in race uh, in a very, very forceful way. So, of course, Mary Shield, in some ways, is, is, is projecting part, she wants to be part of that sort of society and is perhaps uh, 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 applying that. The other thing to bear in mind, of course, is that I suppose a lot of Iranian nationalists by the end of the, or proto-Iranian nationalists, if you want to use that awful term, in the late 19th century were also adopting a lot. I mean, a lot of the self-critique of Iranians to their own is similar, if not more damning than many of the, I mean, I, I think a lot of Iranians look on this as Western orientalizing and British orientalizing towards the East. Actually, if you read the indigenous sources, they're just the scathing. They don't like it, of course, when they see other people saying things about it. But they, and this was always the funny thing about the translation of Haji Baba into Persian. Great success until they realized it was originally in, uh, uh, it was originally written by an Englishman. I think, actually, in Dick's comment about uh, my dear uncle Napoleon, that he was making the comment that uh, he said he translated it into English, and then someone said that he didn't realize it was always in English originally. <laughs> 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 Obviously, wasted effort. Was a conspiracy. Um, so I, I, I think that sort of uh, those aspects are, are certainly quite interesting, quite nuanced about the way in which uh, that uh, discourse worked in the, in the 19th century. And certainly, I mean, my reading of it, anyway, is that a lot of Orientalists tended to see the problem in Iran as a problem of of government, problem, a problem of politics rather than people. And actually, they were much more sympathetic to the, even, uh, I mean, the great Orientalist, they always talk about Lord Curzon. Um, I always point out to my students, of course, that Lord Curzon was just as patronizing to Englishmen as he was to, to Persians. I mean, he thought that famous statement that apparently seeing a number of Englishmen bathing in Brighton, he didn't realize they were so white. Because, <laughs> <laughs> was, you know, they, they, so he, was, he was a patrician, and a lot of them were from a patrician class, and they had a fairly patronizing attitude to everyone. Not necessarily an uncaring one, by the way, but certainly a patronizing one. Um, now, on to, and I'm nearly to going to end now, you need to end. Right, I need to end. <laughs> <laughs> I need to end. Marvellous paper. Thank you very much. Um, really fantastic. And I really enjoyed it. And uh, all I will say now is uh, there's a, a wonderful account of uh, women's situation in Iran by Malcolm in his memoirs, which unfortunately tells us that we've been having the same argument for about 200 years, actually. And the Iranian response to Malcolm is also quite interesting, they say. Um, but I suppose you were going to say, you didn't have time to say, but you were probably going to say about 2009 and how the women were at the forefront of that struggle, which was also quite interesting as well. Uh, well, you're not going to say. Uh, uh, yes, no, no. You were going to say, <laughs> yes. so I didn't say so. <laughs> no, I need to end, so I was going to say, you were going to say that, and I thought that was marvellous. Right, thank you very much, and I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Since uh, we've got overtime, there yeah. won't be much uh, uh, time for a discussion um, because uh, yeah. Grace who told me actually that I had to tell you that uh, oh. the conference was up, right?
going back between explicit mention of women and men in these documents and and the uh, extent to which uh, you know women are empowered or not empowered, or or is that a, is that something which you know is is artic articulated rather loosely with the um, with with the actual you know the actual process and, and uh, social context and so forth? I, I, I'm curious to know because um, I'm curious. <laughs> Go ahead, and then, sorry. <laughs> no, no, just no, no. very briefly, I, I just uh, cover the Irish side very briefly, and then I give over to Ruja, and it's a very interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, yes, when, when we see, well, how uh, the mentioning of men and women in the Constitution is riding into the national discourse, and we see that, for example, in Ireland, covering the Irish side, by um, subsequent legislation uh, being measured on the Constitution in the 1920s and 1930s in Ireland. Um, for example, the 1925 uh, Civil Service Regulation Bill, or the Marriage Bar, etc., etc., um, would, would, or the, the, the acts, the juries acts, I very briefly mentioned from 1924 to 1927, would, would show in how far um, the Constitution and the changes have actually Im influenced legislation, subsequent legislation, and putting the woman in their place, in their private space. And it has not been seen in interpretations um, of that Article 41 of the Irish Constitution as, um, as terribly uh, downing or, or just um, discriminatory. It, it has been seen as a kind of a chance to give the woman the chance to be in the private sphere, not having to participate in the public sphere and having the, the, the time to educate their children, etc. So it, hasn't, it has been put you know, in, in that kind of way and has written into the national discourse, which we see in the women's movement when there was a kind of a an attempt to change those national stereotypes and those images. So women's voices being brought in the public sphere has caused changes within the way um, it has been seen as natural or as unnatural. I, I cited very briefly the reference of Father Carl um, from 1922 um, on the 1922 constitution as unnatural because men and women have been seen as totally equal. And if you go back to the proclamation of uh, the Irish Free State, um, you know, the, you, you see the equality streamed through the proclamation, which was, of course, I would say, um, a sign that men and women have been regarded as equally important in the war of independence and the Easter raising. And their role has, the woman's role has been acknowledged, which has then been taken aback in later years. And we see nowadays in the um, discussion about uh, representation of women in parliament, etc., that there is still this discourse there, you know, but, you know, is it, is it actually of uh, benefit for a woman and uh, what, is the wo what does the women's movement want, etc., etc. So it has been written in the national discourse and has been very daunting for women to, um, to change that, but there has been changes. and that shows like the interaction with the constitution was very important and it got always referred back to the constitution. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, just very quickly, I, I, I think what you're referring to, um, that you can kind of uh, dichotomize into de facto and de jure because uh, like the, the, and then the 1906-1907 supplement constitution in Iran, really the mention of women was also almost non-existent, uh, whether, uh, whereas there is mention, a lot of mention of women uh, within their roles, like within the family in, in the Iranian constitution. But then when you look at the fact that when you look at kind of what's going on in, on the ground, um, and Professor, and sorry, I, um, you know, I, I, if, if we had time to go into it, uh, I would I would have said that uh, women's movement in Iran uh, since after the 1979 uh, it's it, it, the women's position is very very paradoxical because it's not like you know the, it, it from what I said it came across as very uh, kind of grim but but women are are extremely uh, active in public and this was one of the paradoxical kind of outcomes of the Islamic Revolution where women uh, you know came into the public sphere as part of the politi politicization and Islamic Islamic of Iran, you know, uh, um, uh, families which were really, really religious, let the, uh, because of the segregation, because of the veiling, let their children go into segregated the spaces of education. The uh, women are highly educated, like you know, it, it's it's not um, it's not black and black and white, uh, but but still there is uh, like the, the jure discrimination. There is a lot of legal discrimination. 
um, and, and part of the women's movement, like part of their want is, is to uh, reform these discrimination, not only the constitution, but, but only changing the language is not enough. There's other layers to it as well. Me too. <laughs> it's an interesting question. Uh, there is something. There is something of a mystery surrounding the families. Um, what happened with the family after re their return from Persia, which was due to her husband's ill health. He became very unwell to the point of death in 1853, and the family had suddenly had to leave. So he resigned his post. Um, and then after that, there's very little known of the family. They settled in London. They had family connections in Wicklow through the Irish branch of the, the, the Irish branch of the family living in Ireland. And it was on, an, uh, on some occasion that she was in Wicklow that she caught a fever and died and was buried on her own. But there's no real information as to why, whether they were living apart or whether they were separate. All we do know is that during those years that she returned, and remember she was quite young, she was 24 years of age, um, she was half the age of her husband, she was 24 years of age when she went to Persia and she was dead by the age of 44 and she had had 10 children and the 10th was born in that year so I don't know whether it was due to complications with respect <coughs> to that but she's a very interesting character because she never wrote another book, why she wrote this book, what happened with her, what happened with her, uh, what made her, or inspired her to do that, or it, it's quite a, a fascinating dilemma. One of her sons was a quite a well-known nationalist MP uh, in Ireland, and as I mentioned, a number of them went into religious life. So there was a real kind of relig religiosity, uh, Catholic religiosity within within the family or strain within the family. If I may ask a question, many people have, of course. Uh, <coughs> commented on the similarities between Catholicism and Shiism and the importance of rituals um, and so on. Um, could that have predisposed her to have a more sympathetic view of uh, Shiism than Europeans would normally have had of Islam? I think that's a very interesting point. I mean, I, th I think, and she makes some comparisons. I mean, in her book, she comments on on Zoroastrians and on Sunnis, but mainly, and of course it's the majority population, it's mainly the rights of Shia Islam that she, she, right. she actually goes into detail about. Um, and that with respect to the Ashura uh, uh, celebration, she goes into a lot of detail and is, and is genuinely moved by that. So I, I think that's a very interesting comment. And of course she goes into all of the, at great length, into the, into the Babi upheavals and the Bab and all that 
tension surrounding that within, within the country. So I think that's very true. She was very overtly Catholic, and she was not really, she would never uh, abjure that part of her identity. Her Irishness, she certainly kept in the background, but I was trying to say, I think, was that there was a particular reason for that. She probably would not have been uh, accepted, certainly would not have been accepted. Uh, her, her book would not have been accepted if that was uh, very clearly the known. Um, and I think she would have she would have known that uh, that that was the case. There's another point is that every uh, travelogue to Iran contains a chapter on Ashura. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Find a single one that doesn't have uh, that doesn't have a description of as yet play, passion plays uh, mm. and so on. It would be interesting to sort of compare the tone. Mm. Uh, because some people just uh, sort of criticise the, the savageness of it uh, and so on and so forth, and the fact that she was moved. Uh, but she waxes lyrical about the call to prayer. I mean, she makes quite an extraordinary statement that, that the, the bells of St. Peter's and St. Paul's yeah. uh, cannot compare to. You know, so that's the kind of the effect yeah. that it has on her. Yeah. Any other? Yes, sir. Uh, just to the point of interest, uh, as far as Major General uh, Shields is concerned, today in, in UCC there was another all-day seminar on the Book of Lismore, uh, which is on display in the Klutzman Gallery. And one of the book, one of the parts of the Book of Lismore is um, the the travels of Marco Polo. And when the Book of Lismore was discovered, or rediscovered in Lismore in the 19th century, the first Irish person to actually make a commentary on that Irish translation of the voyage of Marco Polo was in fact Major General Shields there. Well, that's interesting. The cycle of <laughs> 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 that's scary, isn't it? Tied <laughs> it all together. Yeah. Um, to ask Moya actually about um, gender and museums because um, yes it, it struck me that um, the whole process of collecting and uh, purchasing and sending and discussing and so on is pretty much you know was pretty yeah. much a male dominated activity and I just wondered to what extent or has, has that this issue been raised to what extent the representation of oriental cultures was well, you know despite the, the, the kind of orientalist tendency to, to feminize or you know, soften oriental mm -hmm. cultures or whatever. Uh, to what extent is it, do you in fact have um, you know, a male gaze represented by the kinds of items that were sent back, the kinds of items that were selected for exhibition? Is that an issue that arises at all? In yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting one, especially if it comes to costume. Because a lot of the textile examples, these are pieces which were acquired in the 19th century as examples of Persian design in textiles, so different techniques, they're mostly um, female costumes. So we have a few male things. We have a pair of Kajar Russ's leather trousers, for example. So we've got the odd thing, which are from like a male only domain, but mostly we have um, women's clothes or fragments of. And I don't know, um, well, in terms of where did, they, where did they get these objects, why did they select them? what was accessible to the likes of Julie Michar and Murdoch Smith when they were buying. We, we have the V&A's archives, but we, we still know so little about where they went to to buy them. But it's interesting that in, in the case of textiles, it's so very feminised in terms of the objects themselves. And when it comes to display, um, then we're really coming into Orientalism with sort of display of picturesque people, or, or women especially. And in terms of how costume has been historically displayed, and the fact that the museum is just weak in male costume of the late 19th century, and suspiciously strong in female. And I, to be honest, I'm not sure if that is because the collector's eye was interested in variety of technique. Perhaps they found it, but I'm, I don't know. I'm just not sure what, what their options were when they were acquired. If they simply took everything they could find, which is possible, or if they made a selection on the basis of some aesthetic judgment. Because the aestheticism of the design museum is, is a really significant part of what choices they made. They made a they made big choices towards blue and white ceramics of Safavid era, for example. And that is not because blue and white was the most important thing Safavid potters made, 
but it's because blue and white craze in Victorian Britain in the 1870s was at a height. And that is the kind of thing a Victorian buyer would choose in the 1870s. And I'm not sure how I can apply that to textiles at the same time. So, yeah, it's a really interesting question, but we don't know enough about what their options were as they were buying. But we know that they were interested in the objects for a design rather than ethnographic or social reality that they were attempting to display with them. That wasn't their mission. It may have been an outcome, but it was it definitely wasn't their it wasn't their overt agenda. So I'm not sure if that really answers your question. Well it, it suggests that there isn't a, a kind of cutting edge debate about gender and museums going on in the sense that you're, you're not fending off that kind of question in um, you know in, in, in discussion. But I mean I suspect that there there probably is mm. a story to be told yeah, about yeah. Um, mm. that aspect of um, museums. Yeah, no, I agree. There are policies here that men would dress like the white models. <laughs> the white models. Turpins and things like that. In general, women's, women's costumes tend to be somewhat more elaborate than men's costumes. So if you were interested in elaboration, as a Victorian design museum would be, that would be your Choice. And if, the other if, thing if is that this, this wasn't, the, these weren't uh, collect, these people weren't collecting items for ethnography museums, anthropological museums. Yeah. The, the artistic dimension was important. I mean, today when I go to any shop anywhere in the world and try to buy textiles, it's usually women's costumes that I find, not men's costumes. Because men's costumes tend most of the time, except for princes and princesses, mm -hmm. to be less elaborate. Yeah. And, the, and it's interesting that you bring up the the two the, the wrestlers uh, trousers about which there's an article in uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, right. in a journal, right? Yeah. I mean, those are embroidered. Yes. Right? So that's so probably the, the why two, they're important. That's why they're there yeah. because uh, they are two items of men's clothing that happen to be embroidered, which is not the case for most uh, textiles uh, associated with men. Yeah. And the, we have a, a blue and gold silk abba as well, which was a fairly practical type of cloak that yeah. people would wear, but this one was only selected because of its, you know, its dyeing or because of its gold right. silk. You know, it, it, it's for technical reasons that it was selected. And it's a phenomenally ostentatious, deaf, beautiful mm -hmm. object, but that's what, those, that's what that sort of Victorian design mission was about. And in fact, it's a, it's a bad reflection, probably, of overall fashion and material culture at the time, because it's based on Victorian selection. So what we have is a good collection of what Victorians would have bought, if you say what I mean, because they... But well, didn't Victorians buy it? Yeah, they did. It's what they oh. selected. It's only, obviously, it's yeah. kind of obvious in a way, but yeah. it, they would have, for every selection, they weren't picking other things. So right. we have a, a version of their taste, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like just to include uh, a similarity between uh, Irish law and the Persian <coughs> and that is abortion. Uh, as I know, a few days ago, the Minister of uh, Justice and Defense rejected the, the proposal of other European countries to reform the Irish law. What is the reaction of uh, you in relation to this for in concept of human rights? I, I, I you're asking men? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if you would like to answer. No, no, you're asking what we think of abortion, personally. Both countries, in Iran and in Ireland, abortion is forbidden. It's difficult. Yeah. And then from, from Ireland, we are going to, to the UK or other countries for uh, abortion because it is forbidden in Ireland. And I know that uh, it was a meeting in the UN a few days ago, and then the minister of uh, Ireland, yeah. uh, he rejected to yeah. reform the law. Well, the many, many European countries, mm -hmm. they uh, protested against this uh, law in Ireland, and they believe that Ireland has to change the law mm. and to al allow abortion mm. in Ireland as Germany or Poland or 
or other European countries, but still the Irish government is going to reject it and doesn't want to change the law. What well, is your reaction in concept of human rights? Okay, the reaction. Well, first of all, it's very complex and it's very complicated in Ireland because there have been Supreme Court cases and decisions, you know, for the right to travel, and there has been also um, the, um, the well, well, changes like the, the, uh, in 1992, two amendments passed uh, to the Irish Constitution establishing the right to travel and the right to information. So it's a little bit more complex, and I suppose the current debate. <coughs> Um, on reproductive rights in Ireland um, is, well, on the one side, yes, of course, you know, there, there is the, perf uh, the performance of, um, the, of abortion in Ireland is, um, is not allowed, as you rightly um, outlined, and there has been, um, well, from the UN and from Europe, a kind of a push towards, um, uh, well, um, changing that law in certain ways. Um, I, I just looked through, and I don't have the actual numbers in my head at the moment, but um, recent opinion polls, you know, at least, you know, um, in, uh, well, in cases where um, there is danger for the life of the mother, incest, and, um, uh, what was, uh, life of the mother, danger, incest, and uh, if uh, there is an abor um, abortion asked um, after um, sexual um, violations, etc., um, they, well, there, there has been definitely uh, cases where, where it has been like semi-legal, you know, and in these cases it has, it has been changed, um, or in the public opinion has been changed significantly since, the, since, the, since 1992, um, where the third amendment, um, which would have defined when abortions could be considered as legal, um, was defeated. So the Supreme Court has a little bit interacted with this third amendment anyway, you know, already and public opinion has changed in Ireland. Um, but if there would be a new referendum, what I would think what the outcome would be is very, very hard to predict. You know, I think, um, that especially in Ireland, the entanglement of religion and uh, nationalism is quite, um, and still there, as I outlined, you know, and there is still a, a fraction there, but um, it's very hard to predict. But uh, opinion polls, ratings, say that there's a considerably mass, critical mass in Ireland who would uh, favor um, abortion if there would be legislation of a certain kind um, proposed, you know, but there needs to be a referendum because it's a constitutional issue, so there needs to be a referendum, um, I think, in, in order to pass that. Um, yeah, so uh, generally, um, I think um, within um, CEDAR and, um, you know, in, in consideration with women's rights and, you know, there is an argument there for reproductive rights and for the promotion, further promotion of reproductive rights in Ireland, certainly, yeah. That's from a public and more personal. Do you want to say something? Uh, about abortion, I just want to point that it was legal in Iran before the revolution. Mm -hmm. Abortion. And about Ireland, just a few years ago, when uh, it went to Parliament to make a decision mm -hmm. uh, um, regarding that just 13 personal uh, Parliament members were me women. So actually, technically, uh, men made the decision about abortion mm. in Ireland. Mm. Is it just 30 um. percent of uh, parliament and very women? So you say it's a really good point. <laughs> good point. That <laughs> well. Well, then, first of all, to, to your point, I think, you know, it's, it's a very valuable, you know, that's what I tackled with political representation. You know, if there's a lack of rep political representation of women, you know, um, the impact of, um, of women's experiences or the, the, the way uh, policymaking is informed by uh, women's experiences is quite... Um, yeah, it's, well, it's not there. You know, women's experience don't, don't inform a policy making if they are, or don't inform in the same way than male experiences if there is no equal representation, you know, so that's for sure. And I'm not sure what, what changes or what, what you refer to. I mean, there was a further referendum on abortion in 2002, but, uh, but that was uh, for the 25th Amendment of the Constitutional Iran. Bill. Oh, so, uh, were you saying about Iran? Iran. Iran. Yeah, Iran. 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 Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was, yeah. Was a which was a comment, that, so that I was won't a make comment. a comment yeah. to your comment. <laughs> you think the 30 women in Iranian parliament? No, no. in Ireland. In Ireland. <laughs> That's where I got the comment. Yeah, Ir Iran, that in Iran, before the 1979 revolution, abortion was, was legal, and then after it was illegal, which is actually is, is more complex again because, you know, Islam and the faith and everything comes into it, and Islamic law, but 
you know, that's, that's another day of discussions. Yeah, <laughs> certainly, certainly. I think yeah. really If there are no other questions, we can perhaps this time wrap up the conference for good. <laughs> <laughs> Any? Okay. I would like to thank not only the uh, four panelists of today, but all the other speakers uh, who have regaled us with their wonderful <coughs> talks and uh, original research today, and especially thank uh, my friend of uh, four decades, Grace Neville, uh, for having uh, hosted uh, and got her uh, institution in University College Cork to host uh, this wonderful uh, conference, which uh, for me personally ex exceeded all my expectations. Thank you very much.